Fishing like a local isn't just about catching fish. It's about connecting with the environment and the people who call it home. It's about hearing the stories and traditions that have been passed down for generations and sharing unforgettable moments with the people you meet along the way. Fishing like a local is having an experience that stays with you forever. And with Fishing Booker, you can experience it too, no matter where you are. Discover your next adventure on Fishing Booker. Midway USA brand product designers have one straightforward goal. Develop high-quality, technically sound products and deliver them to customers at reasonable prices. If you are immersed in the shooting sports industry and pay close attention to every single detail, you know our products are built right and stand up to everyday use. Who has shooting mats and range bag systems to hunting clothing and just about everything for the outdoors? Log on and shop 24-7 with super fast shipping. MidwayUSA.com Welcome to the Casting Across Fly Fishing Podcast. I'm Matthew of castingacross.com, where I explore the quarry and culture of fly fishing. In this episode of the podcast, we're going to talk about safety, particularly safety when it comes to waiting. Now, a lot of times when I'm talking about stuff on the podcast, I'm talking tongue-in-cheek, I'm talking uh, with a little bit of a humorous take on things, but uh, this is a real deal issue. This is a significant thing, and this is something that can make the difference between literally life and death. Recently, I uh, wrote an article uh, called Fly Fishing Might Kill You, and when I started writing the article, and I'll mention it again at the end of the podcast, um, I, I had a completely different perspective on it. Uh, I wanted to talk about how it was actually one of the least likely ways for you to get hurt while uh, recreating outside. Uh, you know, you think about mountain climbing and uh, mountain biking and mountain hiking and all of the other mountain things. But you think of all the things that are particularly dangerous sounding. But then you dig into the data and what actually causes people to die the most outside. And I know this sounds morbid. Uh, but one of the major reasons people die from being outside is from uh, falling. And the second one is drowning. Now, you put these things together and you spend your time walking alongside rivers. You maybe even hike alongside high gradient rivers. Uh, you are spending time in water and you have a high probability that you will fall at one time or another. And for many of us, falling is maybe just inconvenient. It, if you're seeing somebody else do it, it might be humorous. You might just get wet and it might be frustrating, but if you fall in the wrong way, it could lead to serious problems. You can hit your head and you can fall in and, and that would be the end of things. You could fall down and hurt your ankle and uh, then hypothermia becomes an issue. So although, like I said, things often do take a, a tongue-in-cheek look at uh, serious stuff in fly fishing today, uh, I really wanted to go through a number of things that are worth thinking about to keep yourself safe. It's going to be a shorter episode of the podcast, but hopefully these are things that if you've been fishing for a long time, uh, you, you might realize, you know what, I'm doing four of the five things or however many uh, really, really well, but I'm not doing that one. I haven't thought about that one well. Or if you're new to angling, and these are things that you're hearing for the first time, that hopefully they can be helpful to you. I don't uh, uh, have visions of saving anyone's life, but at the same time, uh, everyone needs to hear something uh, somehow, sometime, and hopefully this can be that for you if you are new in fly fishing. So the first thing, and the simplest thing is, uh, know your limits. Know what you're able to do and what you're not able to do. Uh, I, for some reason, can't do exactly what I did when I was 20 years old. I mean, the last 20 years have been good. I've been still in good physical shape. But uh, just like I have to warm up before I throw a baseball, uh, I have to stretch before I go for a run, um, and things don't feel as good in the morning when I wake up, uh, I, I have changed. There's there's differences. And so I need to know my limitations. If you see that awesome pool that requires you to get into a certain spot to make a cast, and there's the direct route, which requires going over a large kind of smooth boulder that is wet, or it's a more circuitous route to get yourself adjacent to that boulder, but it requires you to go around and go over a, a lot more terrain, but you have handholds, then you make the safer, better, albeit longer choice. And I know that this is where I usually get in trouble. I think I can make the jump. I think I can scale the cliff. I think that I can wade through the deep water. Uh, know your limitations. Know what you can handle and what you can't handle. And this is very, very subjective. 
uh, there, there's nothing I can say to you that will determine what your, your, um, uh, limits are, but you know what they are, and you need to be honest with yourself. Especially if you're hitting these these milestones, stones, st- milestones in age or in mobility or in capacity, and you have to be okay with that and see these things as an opportunity to maybe slow down and all take all the benefits that come with that. So that's the first thing: know your limits. Uh, the second thing is polarized sunglasses. Now this might sound kind of silly in the grand scheme of things, how can two lenses uh, improve your odds of staying alive? Well, there's a lot of uh, our walking that our vision influences. So how we move, how we walk is very much influenced by what we see. Now, there's other things that we take into account. There's countless things, actually, that all go into the complex algorithms that make up how we move about our physical surroundings. But what we see is one of the major ones. So having um, polarized sunglasses is helpful because it allows you to see in the water. It allows you to see what you're about to step on. Now, of course, because of the refraction of light and because of the way the objects underwater may seem closer or further away than they appear, um, then you're going to have to move slowly. But being able to see if there is a log that is a few inches above uh, where your feet are, or if it's a smooth stone, or if it switches over to uh, a sandy bottom or mud, or if it kind of disappears is integral. So polarized sunglasses are great for seeing fish, and uh, polarized sunglasses are great for keeping the glare out of your eyes. But they are also very important as we move and move through the water. Now, on the other side of things, uh, you might want to take those sunglasses off while you're walking through the woods. So this is, for me, uh, a something that I have to do when I'm running on trails. For whatever reason, having my sunglasses on, which I wear sunglasses when I'm fishing, I wear sunglasses when I'm hiking, I wear sunglasses when I'm driving, I wear sunglasses when I'm coaching baseball, I wear sunglasses almost all of the time. However, when I'm running on trails in the woods, I do not like wearing sunglasses. I would rather squint than wear sunglasses. The reason being is maybe it's my vision. Maybe it's my eyes, my age, or just the way my eyeballs work. But to, to have that, uh, um, even, even something over my eyes and cutting down on the sharpness of what's in front of me, I don't like it. So this might not be something for you, but for me, when I am moving over rough terrain, I like to have my sunglasses off. And so I can see those, those small, minute details um, with the acuity that I can see them without anything in between me and it. Now, this, if you're walking over rocks slowly, that's not what I'm talking about. But this is something that you might want to consider if you really want those sunglasses for when you're on the water so that you can see the bugs, so you can see the bottom as you're walking, so you can see the fish. Pop those things up on your forehead, or if you have a retainer, drop it around your your chest when you are walking over uneven terrain on dry land. So know your limits first and foremost. Wear those sunglasses. And the next one, which is a no-brainer, is wear a wading belt. Um, If you fall, uh, and you fall in the water, and you fall such that you are submerged, and depending on how tall you are, that might be, you know... uh, to your armpits, or it might even be just like mid mid waist. I'm a shorter guy, so almost all of my waders are like touching my armpits. Um, and I know some guys that are taller, and theirs just kind of like come mid chest. Uh, regardless, if you fall down and you land, you know, on your rear end, you land on your knees, you kind of go sideways, then water is going to start going into those waders, and it will go in very quickly. As you know, water will go someplace where it can go because it is a liquid. That's your science lesson for the podcast. And all of that open area and that air that is trapped between your body and the inside of your waders is going to fill up with water as soon as you fall in, particularly if you fall in in such a way that the opening is oriented upstream so that that current is actually pushing water into your waders. And if you've never experienced that feeling before, it's quite something. Um, even with waders on, if you fall in kind of going upstream, that water will fill you up quickly. If you have the belt on, it'll fill up from your waist up to your armpits. If you don't have a belt on, it will hit your toes immediately. Even a slow moving creek, that water is moving at a faster speed than you, you like to think. So having that wading belt in doesn't keep you dry, but what it's going to do is it going, it's going to trap that air and it's going to inhibit that water from getting 
from your waist down to your toes. This does a few things. Keeps you dry, which is nice. It's a lot easier to dry out waist up than it is waist to toes. Secondly, it's going to trap all that air. And if you are in a real danger situation where maybe you are bobbing in really deep water that you've fallen into, that air that's trapped between your waist and your toes is going to give you the buoyancy that you hopefully need to get somewhere safe. Now, the opposite, however, is a very, very dire situation because now you are not only fighting the current, you're not only fighting the shock, lowercase s shock, of getting into a situation where you weren't planning on going underwater, but now you're underwater. But also now all of that weight and all that resistance from that water is now trapped into your waders. And you probably aren't going to have the wherewithal to snap your buckles. Or if you have a, you know, a vest on or you have a jacket on over your, your waders, um, you're not going to be able to access those quickly. And so it's just a bad situation all the way around. So having a wading belt is incredibly helpful. And I think I've said this recently also, you know, getting a wading belt that is not elastic is great in this situation because that elastic wading belt, as you move, if you are submerged, it's going to allow that water to seep and seek in uh, to different places that it shouldn't be. So know your limits, wear your sunglasses, wear your wading belt. And here's another big one. Contemplate, uh, contemplate a storage solution that allows for a clean front. So I know a lot of people use sling packs. A lot of people don't like sling packs. A lot of people don't like fanny packs. And a lot of people like fanny packs. They just don't want to be the guy that has a fanny pack. Um, a lot of people like a nice traditional vest or a big chest pack. And these are perfectly fine storage options. However, if you find yourself in a situation where you want to be able to see where your feet are, if you want to be able to move through the water in a way that there's nothing obstructing your vision or even your arms or even just your, your motion and having something on you, I know it sounds silly, but think about it. If you have something on you and you're in a precarious situation and there's something on your front or there's something kind of up on your chest, it's going to be a stressor. Now, this all sounds very extreme, but this is borne out in real life and this is true and you can probably have this experience also. So by having a storage option that is on your back, you're mitigating this problem by getting things off of your front. Uh, when I fish with a sling pack, as I'm moving around, I've got my sling pack on my back and so all that's in front of me is a strap. That's all there is. The same thing is true if you have a backpack, all you have on is straps over your shoulders. If you have a waist pack or fanny pack, all you have on is, is a, a buckle around your waist. And in, you can now move, not just in the water, but through the brush and on stream side with nothing in front of you, nothing that's getting hung up. And now you're thinking about one more thing. But more important and more germane to the conversation is now when you're moving through the water, you can look down and you can see where you're waiting perfectly. Uh, this is big in the salt water also. I, I love to not worry about having stuff in front of me as I'm wading over rocks that are covered in all sorts of barnacles and you know other crustaceans and seaweed and things like that. Um, but then also to not have to worry about waves hitting my chest where all my stuff is and how that might hit me in different ways. And if you're wading in the cold ocean water, you know, knee deep, thigh deep, waist deep, then that well, those waves can hit you pretty hard. And if they hit a pack, then they are going to push you broadside. It's like we wearing um, something that, that increases your mass exponentially. And again, if you're a young guy and you're big and you're strong, you might say, this is not a big deal. This is not a problem. But the fact of the matter is, is it will be one day. And it might be the kind of thing where if you don't know your limits and you are pushed past your limits, you would have wished that you had dialed it back a few steps. So that's another kind of quick and easy way to increase your mobility, limit the, the problems that come with, uh, with waiting with a bunch of stuff on you. Get something that moves all of your gear to your back. It allows you to not only move more unencumbered, but see where you're moving much easier. All right. So know your limits, uh, wear sunglasses, uh, wear a waiting belt and get stuff off of your front. Those are the first four things. The last one for all intents and purposes, which kind of circles back to the first one is slow down, slow down. Now, slowing down has a myriad of benefits. Uh, again, for the, the point of what we're talking about today, you are less likely to have an accident or less likely to make a foolish step if you have slowed down. 
That's just common sense. And that's a great thing. That's a great reason to do it. But there's so many auxiliary benefits to slowing down. The things that you perceive if you slow down are much greater than the things that you see if you're moving quickly. A great example of this is if you've ever walked somewhere that you usually only drive. If you're driving, 30, even if there's 35 miles an hour, the things that you see as you're zipping by are significantly reduced to compared if you are walking or riding a bicycle uh, by something. I'm always shocked when I run through a neighborhood or run down a road, the things that I noticed that I never noticed before because I was driving. And that's, that's important because when you're moving quickly, you are focused on one very specific set of variables. But if you're moving slowly, that set of variables widens. And now you have a greater uh, um, kind of range of things that you're paying attention to. So this is beneficial for fly fishing, of course, because you're noticing insects, you're noticing uh, contours of the stream bank, you're noticing things that are in the water, you may be noticing, uh, of course, a fish rising. But there's so many other things that you can see that are specific specifically focused on fishing itself. But of course, there's all of the other benefits that you get from slowing down and appreciating where you are and what you're doing. But again, in the context of what we're talking about today, it means safety and it means just doing the right thing and uh, potentially uh, avoiding an accident. Now, I always tell, tell my kids that if we've told you not to do something um, and you do it and it causes a problem, it's not an accident. It's an on purpose. Um, but of course, we, we don't intend to do things. But if, if you stack up a bunch of poor decisions, um, it's no longer an accident. So you often hear about, you know, a hiker that gets in an accident because he was off the trail and doing something else. Well, it's an accident in that he didn't attend to hurt himself. He didn't intend to get mauled by a bear. He didn't intend to, uh, you know, lose all of his water and get dehydrated. At the same time, getting off of the trail and being where you're not supposed to be is put yourself in a situation where the accident is much more likely to happen. The same is true with waiting. So, so many of us enjoy being waist deep in a trout stream, being shin deep in the uh, New England surf, um, you know, walking a uh, soft, banked, slow moving bass river. These are wonderful ways to spend a day, but it can turn bad real quick. And falling and water are a bad combination. So, these are five quick things. Like I said, these are five kind of common sense stuff, but until you hear them and think about them, they might not be common sense. And my hope is that this will be helpful to someone, whether it be one out of the five or five out of the five, or even just a good reminder for you if you need all five out of the five, um, just kind of reinforced. So if there's something I left off, something that you think is important, I mean, there's there's lots of things we can talk about, you know, the, the soles of your waiting boots. I've got podcasts about, about that. Um, we talked about... Uh, just the style of waders and wading boots and, and ankle support and things like that. Uh, stream bottoms and how to read stream bottoms, which of course has a presentation and a, a, a trout specific uh, aspect to it, but there's also a safety and a, a footing aspect to it. There's lots of other things we can talk about, but the five things I shared today are kind of five quick and easy things that don't really require uh, a whole lot of, uh, of time or investment for you to make work. So like I said, shorter podcast today, but uh, hopefully this this can be helpful. Um, also, I just wanted to mention that we are only a week away, if my math serves me correctly. For some reason, my uh, my website's not popping up quickly enough to give me the information that I want to get. But uh, yeah, we are only a week away from the next um, Fly Fishing Accusations podcast. So if you have questions or comments or accusations, or you want to add something to the list of five things I gave about safe waiting today on the podcast, then do let me know. Matthew at castingacross.com. Uh, Matthew at castingacross.com. I'd love to hear from you. It's always great to get feedback and it's fun to interact uh, one uh, week out of 10 when it comes to podcast episodes. This week on the website, castingacross.com, two posts. The first one is called River Apollo 4. This is the fourth installment of the River Apollo narrative. Uh, again, usually I'm writing tips and tricks, maybe uh, slightly humorous reflections on fly fishing culture, uh, but this is a four-part going on, I don't know how many part series, uh, that is following a gentleman by the name of Paul uh, who lives on a spring creek. So you read the first installment if you haven't and work your way up to the fourth. I'd love to know what you hear about this, uh, what you think about this, I should say. Uh, Matthew at castingacross.com. Again, let me know what you think about this style of writing and this story itself. Then Wednesday's article that came out was called Fly 
fly fishing might kill you with an asterisk. And again, like I said, I started off thinking I was going to talk about how safe it is, but then I got thinking about it and again, not to be morbid, but uh, th there are a lot of inherent dangers and they have to do with falling and they have to do with water. So that was kind of the tone and tenor of that article. But then, uh, of course, informed uh, what I talked about today on the podcast. This week's recommendation is a real no-brainer, but I don't think I've mentioned it on the podcast uh, at least any time recently. Uh, if you've listened to the podcast or read the website for any length of time, you know that I think fly line is an underappreciated facet of fly fishing tackle. It can really make or break not only a gear setup, but your cast and your presentation. And one fly line that has been a premium fly line since its inception but it's still kind of maintained at the same price point, even as fly lines have gotten more expensive, is Royal Wolf's Triangle Taper. The Triangle Taper in the classic floating line is a spectacular line. Um, I fished this on my bamboo. I fished this on a couple of fiberglass rods, and I absolutely love it. It is a great casting rod, uh, or excuse me, a great casting line for these styles of rods. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if for a medium fast action graphite rod, it is equally as um, efficient, uh, but it has a long uh, continuous taper on the head, which allows for a great delicate cast. Um, it allows for a um, delicate cast for a faster action rod, but it also allows for a smooth application of power on a slower action rod, which unrolls that line in a very, very smooth way. So this is, like I said, this is my go-to. If someone gets a, um, a bamboo rod that, and they say, what kind of line should I get? I say, Royal Wolf Triangle Taper. It really is kind of a um, plug-and-play style line. Uh, it's a 90-foot line, comes in a few different colors, comes in lion weights uh, 2 through 9. I've experienced with it in 2 through 5, and I think they're all great. Um, it comes with a few different colors of um, of uh, fly line color, um, but uh, you know there's the bright orange and the yellow into ivory, which I would suggest. They make an olive also, but um, honestly, I don't. I'm not a huge fan of darker colored fly lines, but that's for another topic for another show. But uh, great line. Been fishing it for boy almost 15 years now, and it's been a long, around a lot longer than that, but I can't speak highly enough about it. I would put it in my Mount Rushmore of fly lines, um, which is saying a lot considering, I, like I said, I have high standards for the fly line that you use, especially if you're going to pair it with a really, really high-end rod like a bamboo fly rod, which I do. So I'll put a link to Royal Wolf's uh, Triangle Taper Classic Floating Line on the show notes to this podcast page over at castingacross.com. Thanks for listening to the Casting Across Fly Fishing Podcast. Please subscribe on your favorite podcast app and rate the podcast on iTunes. Then head over to castingacross.com for three posts a week on the people, places, and things that go into the pursuit of fish. life that has the stories to back it a life to be proud of it's a winchester life yeah baby six eight western oh, i'm old there baby right there tune in every tuesday at 7 p.m eastern on waypoint tv